Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled Squeezed in the Sandwich Generation, um, How to Manage ADHD in Your Children as Well as Your um, as your parents. Um, and today we are so um, pleased to have with us um, Dana McDonald, who will be leading today's conversation. Dana is a registered marriage and family therapist and a registered social worker in Canada. She is supervising qualifying with the Canadian Association of Marriage and Family and a counselor at the University of Manitoba. Her areas of clinical expertise include eating disorders, self-compassion, um, emotion-focused family therapy, mindfulness, trauma, and uh, systems work. So today, Dana is going to talk to us about the impact of ADHD across generations and specifically how to survive as the proverbial jam in the sandwich. Um, and that is the caregiver for neurodivergent children and neurodivergent parents, as well as yourself. Uh, as you might imagine, we're going to touch today on executive function challenges, emotional dysregulation, overwhelm, and much more. Um, as one registrant for today's event said, uh, wrote to us in the registration, I've been a caregiver to my mother for the last 10 years, and the stress of managing being a mom to neuro neurodiverse children, an employee, and a wife on top of caring for my mother seems absolutely unbearable at times. I don't understand how others manage it all. So we are here today to let you know you're not alone and to give you some strategies for this time of life. And finally, uh, the sponsor of today's webinar is Play Attention. Research conducted at Tufts University School of Medicine demonstrates that play attention improves attention, behavior, executive function, and overall performance. Harnessing cutting edge NASA inspired technology, Play Attention offers a customized program for children and adults. Your dedicated personal executive function coach will tailor a plan for each family, family member to improve executive function and self regulation. Home and professional programs are available. Contact Play Attention at 828 676 2240 or click the link on your screen to schedule your free consultation. You can also visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting these webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Okay, with all of that out of the way, I'm so pleased to welcome Dana McDonald. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dana, and for leading this really important conversation. <laughs> Well, thank you so very much for having me here. I'm, I'm really excited to be speaking to everyone about this topic because it, it's relevant to me professionally and also personally as well, too. Um, if anyone had a chance to read my blog post that I'd done recently, um, this is also part of my own story. And um, within that, I, you know, I've really found some, um, some peace and some new tools. And it's really changed my relationships with, you know, both my kids and my parents as well, too. So, um, you know, I hope that it's helpful for other people that are watching today as well. And uh, I hope it does lessen some of the the isolation that I really got a sense that people are feeling because that is one of the hardest parts for us, right? Is just feeling that we're alone in the struggle. Um, before we kind of jump into things, though, um, I do want to acknowledge that my own workplace and my home are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis. Um, so for me, as someone living in Canada, it's, it's really important for me to be committed to reconciliation and to continue learning with humility and curiosity and to, and to, to honor Indigenous ways of knowing and healing in my work as a counselor, just as an individual working in the world as well, too. Um, so I just want to make sure that I share that as well, just so you know where I'm located and situated. I'm just going to... Perfect. Um, so just in terms of goals for today, so as, as you heard, this is sort of my... So, Part of my personal story and also part of my my professional work as well too. 
Um, as a marriage and family therapist, I work with families, you know, coming from all sorts of different configurations. Um, and ADHD is a, a pretty common concern that I've, I've heard of. of um, less than until a little bit more recently that I started thinking about my own daughter with, within that context. As well. um, and then my mom connected with me wondering about her own, the, her possibility of her having ADHD as well too. Um, and that, it really changed my relationship with her. It gave me a new lens to see things through. Um, and then I started thinking about myself and within that process also realized that like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm the part of the jam in the sandwich and also someone with ADHD too. Uh, but it has really been transformative for us. So I, I hope that, you know, part of that personal experience will shine through as well too. So I know everyone here already has a good sense of this, but, um, adjust my screen for a sec. Um, I want to talk a little, a little bit about what some of the challenge are, challenges are in a multi-generational ADHD. I get the sense that most people here know that already, right? You know what you're feeling, but I just want to name some of them out loud. And um, so I'm also going to be talking about self-compassion and that's um, a bit of a strategy and a tool and sort of an overarching approach as well. Um, it's something that's been really important for me. I've also used it um, pretty consistently in my clinical work with the families and with, with individuals. Uh, it's something that we really shift our approach to ourselves and any type of changes that we're going to try to make. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about some different tools and ideas to hopefully make things feel more manageable for you and for your family members um, and everyone in the big picture. So uh, there we go. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about the sandwich. So we all kind of know what that might feel like for us already. If you imagine, and again, all of our families are going to look different, right? We're all individuals and all of our families are, are individual as well too. No two families are going to be the same. Um, but just for an example, if you imagine... On one end, one of those slices of bread is going to be our grandparent. And chances are grandparent might be in, like, let's say, the baby boom generation. Um, in terms of media, they grew up with radio and television as their main forms of media. Um, for the most part, and I'm not talking about them as individuals, but just as an, as an overarching generational um, you know, way of being, coming from all different places. There wasn't a lot of discussion about mental health or emotions. That came from different places. Um, and that came, comes from different reasons as well, too. When we think about what was happening in the world, um, World War II had just ended. And one of the big pieces when people went off to fight in that war is that they really needed to sort of like pack in their own emotions, right? Like, like do it for the country, do it for the greater good, um, you know, not necessarily think about how they were feeling about things. So that was a really, that was actually an important strategy that they were using to be able to cope with that. Uh, as well, many of our, our grandparents might have been uh, new immigrants to the country that we're living in as well, too. They might have had to work extremely hard, maybe two, three jobs just to put food on the table. So again, they might not have had time to really think about how they were feeling. Um, or it, it might have been one of those things where it's like, well, I can't stop to think about how I'm feeling because that, that might kind of derail all the things that I'm doing. Um, so just, just wanted to note that, that it's not necessarily a choice that people are making. It's really a bigger generational piece. Um, when it comes to the workplace, usually there was a lot of that sense of like, you know, working hard, committing to one job for the long term. Um, they tend to like to communicate with, by phone call. That's, that's often sort of the, the main way of, um, of connecting. And when it comes to money for a lot of the baby boom generation, we think of them making savings and investing. Now, on the other end of the sandwich, um, we've got our, like, if you, let's say if you have a teen in the house, I'm not sure how many of our viewers might have a teen or multiple teens or younger kids around too. Um, if you have a teen, your teen is probably a member of Gen Z. So they have grown up in a world where social media, smartphones are like totally normal, right? That is their reality. Um, one of the things that I really noticed with, with my teen is that they talk really openly about mental health, therapy, physical health. It's just, it's normalized for them. They talk about emotions talk about it at school, they talk about it on social media, um, totally different than my parents' generation. Um, they're going to be probably experiencing some hormonal changes because they're teens. Um, when it comes to the workplace, they're often sort of focused on quick results. Um, although again, they're young, so that's, that's going to shift over the years too. Their favorite way of communicating, I would say, is probably through the DMs, right? They instant messaging or direct messaging, um, you know, whatever app they happen to be using. Um, and often they'll sort of see spending money or the, the focus on money of money of, as being a form of self-care. Um, and again, that's going to keep shifting and evolving as they get older too. But right now, that's kind of what we often see. Um, and then there's the parent, right? So if you are that parent, you're the jam in the sandwich or the jelly in the sandwich. Um, you might be Gen X. You might be a millennial somewhere in there. 
Um, you probably grew up with like music videos on TV. If you're in Canada, like I am, and I might be much music. If you're American, that's probably MTV. We, we started seeing the internet and cell phones and technology really shifted. Um, we also saw a growing public health awareness that people started talking a little bit more about emotions and physical health and sexual health um, throughout the 80s and 90s as well, too. Um, a lot of the focus when it comes to work for uh, Gen Xers and Millennials is on a work-life balance, uh, which is something, you know, a lot of us, you know, we kind of work to figure that out every day. We might also be dealing with hormonal changes. Maybe it's menopause or perimenopause. Um, when it comes to communication, um, probably really like your emails. I, I sure know that I do. And for us, debt has also been normalized. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it just kind of is, right? It's, it's been a means for us to maybe obtain some of the things that we need in life. Um, but it's, it's maybe a different financial picture than our, our, our parents would have had. So now the challenges that we face, I know everyone here knows that really well already, but I just want to name some of them and a few others that I didn't list on here. Um, but the majority of us are probably dealing with conflicting demands. Right? You've got your kiddos, you've got teenagers, maybe you have adult children, and then your parents are aging at the same time and they need increased levels of care. Um, they might be experiencing maybe the, the onset of dementia or like some Alzheimer's or other chronic illnesses happening for them, um, but they might need you more and need you differently than they, than they might have needed you in the past. And they might be far away, like they might be in your neighborhood, but they might not be. Um, it's, it can be a really challenging thing. They're going to come with sometimes like we're going to have very different beliefs about education, mental health, how we parent our kids. I heard that a lot in the comments as well, too. Um, different beliefs about communication, technology, how fast we get in touch with each other, how fast you might respond to something. Um, and then at the same time, we're dealing with our own executive function issues and we're maybe watching them experience that as well, too. Maybe that's around impulse control. Maybe it's about organization. Um, but there's all of these different pieces that, you know, too much stuff meal prep, grocery shopping, planning ahead, coordinating schedules. There's so many things that we're experiencing are being pulled in different directions. Um, so everyone knows that really well. So I won't spend too, too much time on that side in particular. But one of the challenges when we think of us in this sandwich, right, we're the jam in the sandwich and we're being pulled and trying to do all this different stuff is that for so many of us ADHD folks is that we, we're often carrying a lot of that ne negative self-talk inside. Um, Many of you might have seen this already, this statistic in particular, but the average the average child with ADHD receives way, way more negative messages than they're not ADHD. Um, I was thinking of putting a poll in here because I was wondering how many how many more do you think it is? Because it's it's a whole lot more. Um, it's actually twenty thousand more negative messages than they're not ADHD. And to think that those kiddos are carrying that around with them, right? Like our kids are carrying that around if, if they experience ADHD and we're sometimes carrying it around. It's one of those things where it's almost like we've got this, this lens that we're, we're kind of seeing ourselves and the world through um, because we internalize those messages whether we want to or not. Um, no matter where they're coming from, we, we hold those inside of us. And that can create stress. Um, it can make us feel really dysregulated. And so many folks who, are, who have ADHD are also really deep feelers. It's, it's one of those, those challenges um, where we might be dealing with emotion regulation, but it also can feel positive things really deeply too. But when it comes to this negative self-talk, that means that it can really, it can impact us so deep, deeply because we feel it so deeply. And that can impact our self-esteem and self-confidence as well too. So how do we deal with it? Um, some of us, you know, we hear it, we feel it, we might be challenging it, but a lot of people are also all overcompensating. I'm sure that's probably the case for a lot of folks in the room um, where we are, we end up doing more than we need to do, um, or we work extra hard or pick up extra projects. Um, you know, we try to make sure that everything's kind of going for other people, trying to make sure that everything, um, you know, is in line. And sometimes we're masking as well, too, and pretending everything is okay when it's not. And that takes energy, right? Like, that's not, that's not something you can just do. And, you know, it doesn't take something away from you, right? Like it, like it really does take energy to kind of keep that mask on as well too. So just to think about that, like, you know, many of us are kind of carrying those negative messages from inside and our kiddos might be carrying that and our parents might be carrying that too, right? So in the same time that we might be overcompensating, our parents might've been doing that too, right? They might've felt like they were spinning for a long time as well. So just to kind of think about that, um, you know, kind of hold that with you as well. All right, so so 
So I just want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite tools or lenses that I use in in lots of forms of my work. Um, And that is self-compassion. So self-compassion is an idea that's really been brought into the mainstream by Kristen Neff um, and Tara Brack. Practitioners and Kristen Neff is a researcher as well, too. So self-compassion is, uh, you know, it's it's almost another lens that we can kind of put on ourselves and and put on, you know, the work that we're doing. Um, It's a way of, it's a way of approaching ourselves in the same way that we would approach a friend. So oftentimes we've got this negative self-talk and we're so hard on each other. Uh, we're so hard on ourselves, pardon me. Um, and at the same time, if your friend comes to you and they are having the same struggle, you treat them totally differently, right? Like you would be you know, kind and patient and compassionate. You take the time to listen to them. You might reassure them that they're doing the best that they can and doing a great job. And at the same time, when you do the same thing, let's say you forget something at the grocery store or you lose your keys for the 10th time, We can be so hard on ourselves. We never say the same things that we say to ourselves to a friend. So self-compassion is kind of flipping that around, right? Like turning that around in a way that we bring that to the relationship that we have with ourselves as well. So rather than being critical, judgmental, harsh, mean, right? Rather than just having that voice kind of going and going, we bring compassion and kindness and maybe a little bit of softness, um, non-judgment and warmth. Right, so we kind of slow things down and approach ourselves in that in that same way. Lots of time when I talk about this with people, they're kind of like, "Okay, listen, Dana, if if I start doing that, I'm just not going to do anything, right? Like if I if I stop pushing myself and stop being so hard on myself, what if I just like don't get anything done anymore?" And I think that is a really good example of that that negative ADHD voice in our head as well, too. Um, it's, it's one of those things we kind of need to challenge because realistically, like you can change things, right? Like you can shift and be a little bit more self-compassionate. It does not mean that you're just going to stop doing everything, right? You're just going to be a little bit gentle on yourself. You can be compassionate and you can still be productive, right? Those, those things can definitely exist at the same time. Um, and, and self-compassion is not just a, you know, a nice idea. There's research on it that is really fantastic and it shows that it decreases shame. And I know a lot of people are carrying shame around with them, right? For not doing enough or not being good enough or not being able to juggle all these all these balls or to hold up this sandwich in the right way. Um, it can imp- inc- improve, pardon me, depression symptoms um, and increase rumination, which I think is really important when we think of our ADHD brains um, and avoidance. And that's a strategy a lot of people like to look at as well too, or like kind of might use as well too. So when we're thinking of maybe bringing self-compassion into our lives, um, we, I, I often think of it, and again, I'm borrowing this from Kristen now. Um, so this is one of her frameworks of looking at self-compassion. We think of three real areas of it. Um, one is self-kindness versus self-judgment. So that's kind of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, where we're starting to be more kind, gentle, compassionate with ourselves, rather than having that critical kind of bullying voice that's kind of running in our head. So we sort of shift that from a judgmental voice into a kinder and more compassionate. The next part is mindfulness versus over-identification. And I'll start with over-identification. Over-identification is that idea that if I'm feeling something, it's got to be true. It's me, right? If I've got this thought or if like I, you know, I mess something up and I feel like a failure, well, I must be a failure, right? And like I, I failed at that. So that that's part of what defines me. Um, it's a really sticky trap for us to get stuck in because so many of us, you know, we equate who we are with what we do in the world. Um, And that definitely relates to parenting and taking care of our families. Um, But it's really important that we kind of shift that away, right? And and we move to a more mindful perspective where we can can feel shame. That doesn't mean that we should be alone or unlovable. We can can fail at something. We can forget something. That doesn't mean we're a failure, right? Like that failure is, is just one event that's happened for us. So we just notice things, name them for what they are in a non-judgmental way, and just sort of let them be, right? Just to kind of move, move along, let it float away. Um, the last part, and this is the part, as I was reading through your comments, this is the part that really resonated with me, and I hope it resonates with you as well too, is the idea of common humanity versus isolation. And for, for us in this ADHD sandwich, so often we feel like we are alone, right? Like it is just us. We're so busy. We don't have enough time to connect to our friends, You know, people feel pulled in all these different directions. You're running all the time. You've got dysregulated family members. That feels like it's your fault. So many things. We feel so alone. Common humanity is sort of, uh, you know, looking at that in a different way. That like, no, you're you're not alone in that struggle, right? And 
all human beings, we all struggle, right? Like we, we all experience pain and big emotions and we all suffer at times and we all like forget our keys and, you know, make mistakes. Um, that's part of our human experience. It's not just us, right? Like it's not just this personal failing. And that for folks with ADHD is so, so important because oftentimes we're, we're comparing ourselves and sometimes other members of our family or our family as a whole um, to neurotypical folks and, you know, maybe their ability to organize or, you know, juggle things or make sure all the laundry is clean, um, you know, or to make arrangements for, for family members, manage bills. It is more challenging, right? Like it's not a fair comparison. Um, and just recognizing that we're not alone. This is a common struggle, especially for families where ADHD is part of that sandwich. Um, so I hope you can kind of take that with you. Um, so for self-compassion, I want you to just kind of just carry that in your mind for the rest of um, this presentation that we're, we're going to be talking through today as well, too. And as we talk about some of these other aspects, um, just kind of just kind of keeping that as part of the, the story or a lens that maybe you can see it through. Um, so my first suggestion for everyone who's out there, um, and, and one thing before I move into the some of the more kind of tasks as well, too, some of the, um, the tools and tips, I also just want to say that not everything I'm going to share today is going to fit for everybody. And that is that's totally OK, um, because we're all individuals and because our families are all different. Some things are going to fit and some things are not. And I, I, I support you in that. I support you in trying different things, experimenting with them, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, and also just leaving yourself flexible in the sense where this is going to change, right? Like what your family needs right now is not going to be what they need in a year or like five years or 10 years, right? Like our kids are going to get older, we're going to get older, and so are our parents. Um, and our family constellations are going to change too, right? New people might join, people will pass away. Um, th these things are going to shift. So we're going to need different tools and strategies throughout our lifetimes. Um, and we, we do need some flexibility around that too. But that said, I do hope you take a few pieces that do fit for you right now and are useful for you today too. So looking at this with compassion, I encourage you to really be curious about yourself and know yourself and your hot spots. Because otherwise we can start feeling like burnt toast, right? And that is not a good feeling. It is, it's so easy for us to kind of start putting ourselves in too many different directions um, and trying to do too much and criticizing ourselves in the process. Every single one of us walking on this earth, we all have different strengths and different challenges. Um, and especially true again for ADHDers, right? Like we're going to have good times of day. There's going to be times where it's like, okay, if I try to do paperwork after 5 p.m., I'm not going to be very productive. Um, if I need to have a tough conversation with somebody, is there a good time of day for me to do that? Probably. If I ask my teen at the end of the day to you know, clean up her room or pick up her laundry or put stuff away or organize stuff at the end of the day after her meds are worn off, like that is going to be a frustrating conversation in so many ways. It's a good thing for us to know ourselves and know our family members in that sense. Um, and also optimize that, right? Like if I know, hey, like if, if she has five minutes to tidy up her room in the morning, that's a good time for her. So let's use that instead, um, rather than trying to kind of go with things as they, as they come, right? Really knowing ourselves is really helpful. And, and know your hotspots. So all of us have things that kind of get us as well too, um, that, that might sort of like irritate us or really kind of grind the gears inside too. Whether that's like clutter or cleaning up after you make a meal or transition times, which I know for like my kiddos, like that, that is a real challenge. Um, those things are, are really difficult. If you know that um, like organization is a challenge for you, just, just knowing that and being compassionate with yourself around that and then bringing in some tools or supports or like if you have a friend who's super good at organization, rope them in, right? Bring them in for you. Um, listen to blog posts, listen to other resources to kind of get those tools. Um, there's tons of them on the Attitude website um, that you can use as well too. So just bring in those tools to support and mitigate as much as you can. Um, the next piece, this sounds so simple. It's not simple. So I don't want anyone to feel that I'm telling you this um, and expecting you to kind of walk away and be able to like integrate this right away. But practicing acceptance of what is and where things are at is, is actually a strategy that can help so much with all this. Because so many folks that I have met and worked with who have ADHD are really good at sensing the emotions of people around them, right? And then wanting to change them sometimes or make things better for people who want help sometimes. Um, it's really, really important for us, for our own well-being, um, and just for that, the bigger system, 
is that we kind of know what we can change and we're honest with ourselves about that. And we really accept what we can't change and just supposed to know the difference. Um, a pretty common concern that I heard in the comments was that, um, you know, if someone maybe has a, a parent who is, is not on board with seeking an ADHD diagnosis, or they just, they won't see that for themselves. You can have those conversations with them, right? You can, you can chat with them about it. You can show them articles, send them memes. If they're not open to it, that's where they're at. Um, and it, it doesn't mean you have to like it or agree with it. But just accepting that reality can kind of help us to separate ourselves from that struggle and give us a bit of a sense of peace in it too. And as I say, that's not easy. I don't expect that to be an easy thing. Um, but just kind of working on that and allowing ourselves to say like, okay, I don't like this, but this is the way it is right now can help us sort of slow that down and then move forward as well too. All right. Um, the next piece that I think is quite important okay, really important for folks with ADHD and their families, um, is to use your supports. Um, This is, this is tough because this isn't a fair playing field. I think it's, it's important to think about that, that some of us might live in bigger cities where there's more resources. Some of us have a way more financial means than others. Some of us who are co-parenting, right? Like that, that can be a challenge. Um, You might have access to less extended family. If you're living far away from your family in a different country, you're not going to have the same supports that you might have. Um, Or in, you know, if, if your community doesn't really support the idea of ADHD, um, that's going to be a challenge as well too, or, you know, the school that your kids go to. But if you do have some supports, they're available to you. Use your supports. Find those people who are on board for you and who are going to walk with you, um, who are going to champion you and your family and your kids and help you out, whether that's a paid resource or a community resource, a friend, um, other folks with ADHD, right? Whether it's an online community, I really encourage you to like cultivate that and find the people who can kind of walk with you and share some of those struggles, right? That common humanity, even listening to blogs, right? Like or listening to podcasts. When you hear other people talking about their experience uh, parenting or um, you know, having elderly parents, it, it's so normalizing and validating for us. And even if you, you know, it's challenging for you to find other resources in the community, um, I really do encourage you to, to tap into some of those resources as well too. If you have the means, um, you know, maybe you hire a cleaning service. Maybe you can get an organizer to help come in and help you. Um, Maybe you can get some apps. Like there's different technology that we can utilize as well too. But using those supports and using those tools can lessen the burden for us to feel responsible for, you know, for sort of managing those executive function challenges and all the, the, you know, the things that are kind of floating around us too as we try to navigate the sandwich. The other piece that I think is, is is genuinely challenging for everybody, everybody in the world, but especially for folks with ADHD is boundaries. Again, because so many folks are have a little bit of difficulty with that um, with the emotion regulation and they feel things really deeply. They're super feelers is the emotion focused family therapy word. Um, for us super feelers, it's, it's tough because if we know someone needs something or wants something, we really want to help. Um, we want to do something about it, right? We want to make them feel better or we just don't want to feel guilty. So sometimes we can overextend ourselves and it's so important for us to have those, you know, those good boundaries, um, which is a skill, right? Like it's not something that's just innate for us, but, but just kind of just uh, being able to develop that as well. It's especially challenging, I think, because if we have a parent who has diagnosed or suspected ADHD, they might not have modeled boundaries super well either for the same reasons, right? Um, maybe that's out of necessity, right? Or maybe just, you know, they just didn't know they're doing the best they could trying to keep people happy. Um, there's cultural expectations about, you know, how much we're supposed to be doing as well too. And if, if your cultural community feels like you're supposed to be helping your family, no matter what, um, that's going to impact you too. And there are gender expectations around boundaries, right? Like, um, it's, it's not uncommon for women in communities to be expected to, to do a lot and caregive and keep other people happy and stretch ourselves into create our, turn the bread into a pretzel, right? That we're, we're supposed to be going in all these different directions. Um, and, and for men to be problem solvers, right? And be able to, to sort things out for people. Um, so it really is tricky, right? And we're going to feel that even more deeply. But because, again, of that emotion regulation piece and that deep feeling, It makes it especially important for us to have those boundaries and maintain them. So so I've created a little bit of a quick cheat sheet, if you want to call it that, for all you you damn sandwiches out there. Um, Because there are specific challenges, especially for folks with ADHD when it comes to boundaries. 
Um, for many of us, it's, you know, might be hard to say no. Um, if that's the case for you, I would suggest you consider exploring new ways to say it, right? It doesn't have to be a hard no. But there are tons of good resources um, out there about different alternative ways to say no. Um, and I would encourage you to practice in like a low pressure situation. So, you know, if somebody tries to upsell you when you're, you know, getting your coffee in the morning, practicing your nose there, right? Or practicing one with a friend who you feel really comfortable with. Um, try out different ways in like low pressure situations and then sort of bringing it forward. Um, sometimes we just need to repeat ourselves with our no too, right? And standing firm. Um, and that's okay too. Or we can also suggest an alternative, right? Where it's like, you know, mom, I know you want to talk right now. I'm so sorry. I'm so busy. Can I call you back in half an hour? And they say, no, no, I got to I'm so sorry. I really can't, but I will call you back though. Right. And we might need to repeat that a little bit. Um, so just, you know, kind of giving that alternative, um, and putting that out that can be really helpful. Uh, the second one I felt when I was reading your comments as well, too, that lots of times we feel like we don't have time for ourselves or we don't have time for self-care. It's so important to remember that self-care does not just mean like a spa day, right? It doesn't mean like a weekend away. It might mean that. Um, but self-care is also taking care of yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It, it's just doing those little things that kind of help you feel regulated. Um, it might be as simple as brushing your teeth or having time to take a shower. Um, it, it's really those little moments. Um, and they can kind of build up and and feel like they they support us in those ways too. I really encourage you to schedule your self care, right? Like if you need 15 minutes after a tough meeting to sort of gather yourself and move forward, put it in your schedule because if you don't, something else will get in your schedule. Especially if you have parents who need you and kids who need you at a workplace possibly that needs you too. Um, it's so important to have those buffers because just in case things they will pop up, right? And if they don't, then you got some self care time. Um, and you can also decide if you're going to give that time up. The other piece that often comes up is guilt, right? It's your own guilt or others' guilt. Use that self-compassion and that self-talk. And just because you feel the guilt, this is so important, it does not mean you're doing something wrong. It just means you're feeling the guilt, right? We can feel that and still make the choice to protect our boundaries. Um, when it comes to interruptions, let's say, or like intrusions on your space, like if your parents are kind of dropping over without you know, letting you know they're coming by uh, and that doesn't work very well for you. Or maybe it's during the pandemic and your kids like to walk into your office sometimes when you're working. Um, you know, be firm. You can also kind of assess things like, does this need your time right now? Or can you do it later? Uh, maybe it's just commit to doing it at a later time. I've also used humor with this to, you know, with some success as well too. I think tapping into that can be a really good resource for it as well. Um, but you can kind of play with that too. Mute your phone, put it on airplane mode, right? Like log out of your email. It's okay to do any of those things to protect yourself and your time. Um, the last piece before I kind of move on to my, my next piece um, is just to reiterate that creating boundaries is a skill, right? Having those boundaries and setting them, it's not something that we were born with. It's not something that's innate. Um, some people, you know, maybe have it a little bit easier than others do, but it's also okay just to kind of keep in mind that it, because it's a skill, we can learn it and hone it and develop it at any time in our life, right? We can carry that with us throughout our lives. All right. So we are going to talk just before you move on about validation. Uh, we've got about, uh, I think we've got five minutes left or so. So let's talk a little bit about validation. So validation is a skill that um, you know comes out of EFFT literature. So that's emotion focused. I, I think it's such an important thing for folks with ADHD to validate the other people in our lives, right? To validate our parents or our friends, but also to have that validation skill for ourselves. Validation, you know, it sounds like an easy concept, but again, it's a skill. Um, lots of times when you think that we're, we're validating someone, right? Like let's say your kiddo comes home and they've had a bad math test and you say, um, you know, they're like, mom, I failed. Like, I feel awful. I studied so hard. And sometimes our our, our urge is to go like, oh, honey, like, like, I know you can do it. It'll be okay. Like next time, don't worry. Um, you know, you're going to be okay. And I believe in you. It's like, well, that's great. But then you're kind of, you're cheerleading, right? You're not validating. Um, sometimes we jump into problem solving, right? And we're like, oh, I'll get, well, let's get you some tutor. Can I call or get you a tutor? Can I call your teacher? Um, let's go through it together. We're jumping to problem solving. We're trying to be helpful, right? But that's, we're still not kind of getting to the kind of the root of it. And that's the big emotion, right? Your, your kiddo or yourself, you're feeling that big emotion. And I have a picture of elevators here because if you imagine that 
when, you, when you're feeling that big emotion, when something really difficult happens, it's like the elevator's on the top floor, you can throw all the strategies and problem solving and cheerleading at it in the world. But until that emotion calms down, that elevator gets back down to the ground floor, you're not really getting anywhere. And if you have a kiddo that has big emotions or a family member, you have big emotions, it's so important for us to like have that validation, that soothing, that regulation before we start the problem solving. So if this resonates for you, um, I'm going to share this tool from, from uh, Emotion Focus Family Therapy with you. You can take it with you. Um, we can practice validation. There's a bit of a... Sorry, it's there we go. Um, it's a bit of a three-step process or a, a one plus three-step process. So the first step in validation is just to, to tell the person, like, I hear that you're feeling, I feel like you're feeling devastated right now. Oh my gosh, I feel I hear you're feeling angry right now. And then, then we sort of, we give our reasons or why we understand that with three becauses. And those three becauses are key because that shows that we really get it. I hear that you're feeling disappointed right now, right? Like you're so bummed because you, you failed a math test. And that, that totally makes sense. You feel that way because you studied so hard and because you usually do really well in math and because I know you don't want to disappoint your teacher. And each, each time we use those because it's like the elevator comes down, just like one floor just kind of keeps coming down and you can kind of check in with the person. So it's because you know, because your teacher, you know, you really don't want to disappoint your teacher. Yeah. And your team might be like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And you're like, oh man, that sounds really hard. And they're like, yeah, it is. And then you might have some more because of this, right? Like, well, yeah, no, you know, because if you fail this test, does that mean you're just staying for recess? Well, yeah, I did. It's like, oh man, that, that, that's really, that, that's a bummer, right? I hate to hear that. Um, and you'll kind of, you'll sense it, right? Like the, that, right, that feeling where things kind of come down that's when you can be like, oh man, do you need a hug, right? That problem solving offers some comfort. That's where you can kind of bring in those tools or like, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you want a snack? Do you want to sit down later? We'll go through it together. That's where you can offer, offer the problem solving. But with validation, it's something that you can use for yourself. It's something that you can use for parents if they're having big emotions. And it's something that you can use for your kiddos. And, and again, this comes from um, emotion-focused family therapy uh, literature uh, from Adela France and uh, Natasha Files as well, too. So I want to just credit them for that as well. Um, I know that we are coming right up to time. Annie, is that kind of your thought as well, too? Um, yes, I'm ready for Q&A whenever you are, Dana. But, yeah. um, but we're okay if you have a, a few last points you want to wrap up. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking I've, I have one more slide I'd just like to share as well, too, just before we kind of, before we jump into that. Um, and I, I'll kind of go through it a little bit more quickly than I normally would, but I just want to bring it back as a starting point as well, too, uh, or as an ending point. To take forward the idea of like, would I say this to a friend? Because we, you know, we all know when we're feeling hard on ourselves, we can be really cruel. We can be mean to ourselves. Um, if you find yourself in that situation, right, where you have or you're putting lots of pressure on yourself to get so much done um, or telling yourself all the things that you didn't do, just, just pause, take a breath, ground yourself if you need to, and just ask yourself, would I say this to a friend? Um, the answer might be no, right? And then you can ask yourself, what would I say to a friend in this situation? Um, so if, if you can use that tool, I really like visual reminders, particularly when we've got those executive functioning challenges. So if you want to put a little sticky note somewhere or like write it on your mirror, Put it somewhere where you can remember. Um, put it on your phone lock screen. Just like, would I say this to a friend? Just to kind of remind yourself and to kind of keep that um, keep that top of mind for you as well too. Before we go to questions too, I, I meant to give a quick shout out um, at the beginning of our, our presentation today too, and I didn't. Um, but I just want to add that as well now to one of my colleagues at the university, Dr. Kim Kiley. Um, Kim is a friend and colleague of mine too, and we've had some fantastic conversations about um, ADHD, and she shared so much expertise with me too. So. Um, I just wanted to, to put that out there as well to you before we move to the Q&As. Wonderful. Um, Dana, thank you so much for this presentation. There's a lot of good takeaways. And before we get into the Q&A, I will quickly thank Play Attention once more for sponsoring today's webinar. And then I'm going to take a page from your playbook because I really love this concept of validation. And so I'm going to dovetail that with the survey <laughs> that our registrants took at the beginning of this webinar. And I'm going to say, 
you know, what I'm hearing and what I know from my personal experience is that being the jam in the sandwich is really hard. And it's hard for the reasons we see in this survey. Number one, the emotional strain and stress is significant. So 21% of you said that that was your, um, one of your top three primary challenges. It's also really tough right behind that because of overwhelm. I mean, there's just no way to change the fact that there are 24 hours in a day and that we're exhausted, right? By the end of the day, um, there's no quick fix. There's no easy fix. That's just hard. Um, and uh, this kind of is a repeat of number three, which was um, 17, almost 17%. So the lack of time and bandwidth mm. for self-care, right? When you have a to-do list that is 25 items long every day, um, yoga is going to fall off every single time, Absolutely. right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it's so I tough just... because the list never ends, right? There's always going to be something else for us to do. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm validating right now based on this data and you guys can take this home with you, um, and remind yourselves that the data shows that this is really hard. Um, and that, you know, everyone is doing absolutely the, the best that they can. Um, and I think that kind of, um, goes into maybe one of the first questions that we got here. Um, and that is from someone asking, you know, they are the jam and, um, they were not modeled emotional control and regulation as a child. And now they absolutely see the value of it, but they are trying to put in place systems in their household to, um, teach emotional control to their children and their parents. Um, mm. can you offer any advice for getting everyone on board with some strategies to bring the temperature down in the house? Yeah, I guess they, they, they didn't share if everyone's living under, like everyone's in one house or is that? That's a good know? question. Yeah, I don't know. That would change things too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would. Um, I yeah. don't think that they specified. Okay. Okay. That's fair. You know, I, and I think like what, what they've said about, um, you know, not having that modeled for, for them as when they were growing up is such a common experience. Right. And I, like, I think the vast majority of parents were doing the best that they could with the tools that they had. Right. And that's, you know, based on culture and, um, you know, the, the generation they were in and the tools they had available and, um, you know, so many different pieces, you know, just recognizing like emotion regulation it, that's skills, right? Like it's not, again, something that's innate. Um, and it's something that we can learn throughout our lives as well, too. I think, you know, as, as much as possible, like, like different things are going to work for different kiddos and different um, parents as well, too. So there is a bit of experimentation, right? To kind of like find out what, what works and find out what fits, um, you know, playing around with that a little bit, too. And as much as possible, like making it fun. Um, kids love movement, right? Like I think that's, that's an often, a, I think as, as, it, as adults, we like movement, too. Um, but finding different things that are like active ways to engage and that emotion regulation as well, um, especially for kids. This, this is a great fit with our sponsor for today as well, too. The idea of like using play um, and play-based methods as um, ways to teach emotion regulation. Books about emotion regulation can be really helpful for kids as well, too. Um, but, but being curious about it. And again, like with the executive function challenges that most people with ADHD are facing too, is having those reminders in different places, right? So if you feel silly putting a sticky note on your door, um, you don't need to, right? Because it's your house and you get to do what, you, you do what fits for you, right? Do what's going to be the best for you and your family. Um, and it does sometimes having that visual cue sort of, you know, gives us a little, that little nudge, that little reminder, um, you know, to pause and take a breath before I walk out the door, um, you know, or check that everything's in my bag, but just you know, using those visual tools can be really helpful. Okay, wonderful. Um, and on the, um, the theme of kind of tips and tricks, a couple mm -hmm. of people have asked, like, can you offer a few examples of what compassionate or kind self-talk sounds like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think if we were to imagine, oh, good goodness, I'm just thinking about like what what average self-talk might be if you, let's say if you lose your keys, right? I'm going to use that example just because that's something that's, that's not unfamiliar to my household. Um, you lose your keys and you're like, oh, I did it again. Um, you know, everyone's going to be mad at me. People are going to like laugh at me or make fun of me. If, if we were to shift that, even just 
starting with noticing, right? And just being like, oh, I lost my keys. You pause, kind of maybe notice what's happening inside for you, right? And just naming your emotion as well too. Oh, I lost my keys again. I feel really disappointed in myself. Um, this is really hard, right? Like sometimes this makes me feel like a, like a failure or a scatterbrain. Um, you know, but this happens to other people too, right? I had a really busy day. I was trying to, I was thinking of too many things at once. It's not good that it happened, but you know, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. Um, this happens to lots of people with ADHD. This is one of the struggles. It's just, it's not just me. Um, and you know, it's, it's a solvable problem, right? It's something that we can kind of work through too. You might even just tell yourself, um, you know, like, like, whoa, this feels really bad, but like, don't beat yourself up. You know, you don't deserve that. Um, or also asking yourself like, okay, what would I say to a friend? Um, and you might, you know, you might validate their feelings. Oh, I know that's going to be so frustrating, right? Like now you got to go get your keys made. Maybe you change your locks. Maybe your landlord is upset with you. That is really frustrating. We all do it sometimes. Right? Like it's, it's not just you and just that, that validation again, too. So it's a bit of a, a melding of both of those tools. Um, but the, there's, I think that at the beginning it's pause, notice what's happening for yourself emotionally, and then use that gentle supportive language that you'd use with someone else. Okay, great. Cause this dovetails with another ah. <laughs> question that we received from, um, you know, a parent who said that, um, their parent, the grandparent really does see um, their grandchild's, um, ADHD symptoms when they manifest as like a character or a respect Mm -hmm. issue Mm -hmm. and not as a symptom of a neurological condition. Mm -hmm. Um, so (laughs) can we offer some help to, um, (sighs) to explain ADHD in a way that can mend this relationship and get the parent out of that referee role um, yeah which we so know that, is so exhausting it, it kind of sounds like the grandparent in that situation is maybe um like trying to discipline the grandchild or like lecturing maybe or something along those that's lines. what i'm hearing yeah. here and i'm i'm hearing it from other people saying that um this might be particularly true when the grandparent themselves has adhd and is not mm-hmm. diagnosed or treated yeah. And that's a tricky one too, because I think that's some of that, that's that, you know, stigma about mental health or emotions or ADHD that, that sometimes we're carrying right from different places. Um, you know, and our, our parents or grandparents might be carrying that as well too. And even just recognizing that like there, there might be that, that stigma inside, right. Where it's maybe it's something that's maybe bigger than the, you know, the, the individual who's holding those beliefs as well. Um, one thing I, I can imagine in the situation, when you see that happening, if you got a little bit of your own impulsivity, you want to intervene in the moment, right? Um, I I would say, and I would suggest as much as possible, have those conversations at a different time, right? Like maybe you go out for coffee and you're like, mom, talk a little bit about like when, you know, when my kiddo starts throwing things, let's say, or has really big feelings. And, you know, like you, you know, you're kind of encouraging me to discipline them in this particular way. Can we talk about that a little bit? And just kind of put that on the table. Have that discussion at a, at a separate time. Um, ideally, at a time that you can kind of both agree on, um, you know, kind of create that, uh, set the stage, if you will, right? Like, uh, or set the table. Um, and just have that discussion on at a time when you're calm and grounded, you can prepare for it. Um, if, if it helps to share a little bit of, like, information about ADHD with them, if they're open to that, that can be really helpful. Um, sometimes it helps, too, to kind of talk about maybe some of the, you know, the symptoms in a like in a non-clinical way in terms of like what things, what it might feel like to have ADHD or what, what kind of things someone might struggle with. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, the grandparent might sort of see that in themselves as well too, but that, that might not be the case. Um, but I would say super important to have those discussions at a, you know, at, at a time when it's not right in the heat of the moment, because everyone's emotions are going to be running high then too, probably not going to be productive. Um, yeah. And it's tricky because I'm just thinking that the grandparent themselves is also probably struggling with some impulse control when they see something that they're perceiving, um, you know, as a willful behavior or misbehavior when it's really, it's part of the ADHD as well too. Um, and, and extending compassion to yourself and also, you know, to, to your kiddo and the grandparent too, just recognizing that they're, they're holding those beliefs for a particular reason. Um, you may not be able to change that, but you can have those boundaries for yourself and your child to make it feel emotionally safe. Okay, great. And, you know, I do, I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people here today saying that, 
um, you know, they are like 95% sure that their, um, their parent or perhaps their parent in law, um, does have ADHD symptoms and, um, they were not ever diagnosed and, or seeking treatment. And they're wondering whether, um, it is really their place to, to try to educate them Mm -hmm. on a diagnosis. I mean, um, I can understand how that is going to be awkward and add another (laughs) strain at the same time. If your parent does seek treatment, it is going to probably improve everyone's life. So you're incentivized to have that conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's so delicate, right? I think it can be a delicate conversation and it's going to, so much of it, right, is, is also going to depend on the relationship that you have with your parent um, or with that in-law or with a grandparent or whomever it will be. Like, like there's each of us, are, you know, those relationships are nuanced and there's probably not like one, one answer that's going to be a, a one size fit all kind of approach. Um, you know, you you kind of know them, right? Um, and just kind of keeping that in consideration as well, too. Um, you know, just to share a little bit of my own personal story. For, for my mom, she kind of came across this out of her own accord. Um, she she gets a, a monthly retirees magazine, and there was actually an article in there about older adults with ADHD. And through reading that, she actually contacted me and was like, like, Dana, like I think that so much of this resonates for me, right? Like this, you know, this is like I like I do this and I do this and um, named a, quite a few of the pieces that really, um, you know, she saw herself in as well too. And that was really helpful because it had kind of, she kind of come across it in her own time. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't necessarily something that I had seen it through that lens either. Um, but it was, it was really, a, a like a, a transformative shift for us in our relationship because things that had felt so personal for me in the past, like so, so personal, all of a sudden I saw them through this lens of, of ADHD and it's like not something that she was doing willfully or on purpose or, you know, to, you know, to kind of get under, get them under my, under my, uh, under my skin on my nerves. Um, it's, it's been such a huge shift for us too, right? Um, and whether or not your, you know, your parent or your grandparent would choose, you know, treatment or medication, even just understanding some of the things that they might be struggling with, whether it's an executive function challenge or, um, you know, emotional regulation concerns, sometimes for them too, that can just sort of shed light on like, oh, well, why is it so hard for me to get rid of stuff? Or, um, you know, why, why do I sort of say things and then regret it afterwards? Or, you know, maybe why have I used, um, you know, a particular coping method throughout my life, even when I know that wasn't a good idea. Um, it, it can be so, so helpful. Um, you know, maybe even sharing a link and, or sharing an article that's, uh, that you find helpful. Again, it's going to depend on that relationship that you have too. So I wish there was one answer for this I could give, but it's, um, it is really dependent on your own family constellation too. Mm -hmm. And if you, I will make a plug. If you have a family member who you think would read it, Attitude has a few great articles about how, um, that we will put in the resources for, um, for this webinar about how ADHD does manifest older in older adults and also a few testimonials from folks who were diagnosed in their 70s and 80s who say that it really transformed their lives with or without treatment um Absolutely. you know some of them chose chose not to or couldn't for medical reasons and um there's still benefit there so we'll pull together some of those because it sounds like that might be helpful for for some yeah. of our attendees really. today Absolutely yeah and I think it it, it can really it can really shift someone's, um, you know, just the way the relationship that they have with themselves as well to understanding themselves in that different way. Um, and, and that can change our relationships as well. Right. So I think if, yeah, if you could share some of those articles, that would be excellent. Of course. And you mentioned, um, coping mechanisms. So, so we know from research that, um, people with undiagnosed and untreated ADHD do have a higher prevalence for, um, you know, self-medicating. Um, Mm -hmm. and that often can mean, um, alcohol use. And a couple of people here saying that, um, this is a boundary issue, right? They have an older, Mm -hmm. um, parent who, um, has been self-medicating through alcohol and and some cigarettes. Um, Mm -hmm. that's a tough one, um, (laughs) about, about setting that boundary and sort of, um, refusing to, to support that mm-hmm. self-medication. Any advice for those people who see their parents with, um, you know, destructive 
habits that you can understand why it's happening, but it just is sort of untenable to live with. Absolutely. Oh, that's it is such a tricky thing, right? Because like we love them, we just don't we don't agree with what they're what they're doing to cope. Um, you know, and I think it is it's important to recognize that it is a coping strategy. Um, but that doesn't necessarily change the way that we're going to feel about it as well, too. Um, you know, your safety and your family's safety comes first too, right? So if that, the, that alcohol use or any other sort of coping behavior creates a, a, a safety concern for, you know, yourself or when your kiddos or a different family member, that, that's got to be your first priority. Um, and sometimes we have to be really firm with our boundaries um, in those regards. So that's, that's okay. You know, I want to give you permission to, to do what you need to do to take good care of yourself as well. Um, you know, if it's, you know, if you want to set a boundary where there's no alcohol at family gatherings, well, that's, you know, that that's absolutely your prerogative as well. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing though, too, because, you know, if they are in a, you know, a, let's say a pre-contemplative place with, with changing that behavior, um, it, it can be challenging for you to, you know, to kind of push them in that direction. So, taking care of yourself in the best way that you can as well too, getting support, talking it out with other people who get it. If you have siblings who are on the same page as you or friends, um, you know, if there's resources in your community for folks that are, um, you know, working through alcohol use or other substance use um, issues, reach out, right? Like, like use those resources, get that support. Because again, that isolation is one of the very hardest things. Um, and so often when I see people who, who join groups or um, even online communities, one of the most helpful things is knowing you're not alone and hearing other people's stories because you're getting tools and, um, you know, anecdotes and things that you can relate to. And oftentimes there's things that you can actually use um, in your own relationships as well too. Yes. And we have had a few people ask whether um, you know of any um, support groups specifically for the jam, um, whether Ooh. neurodivergent <laughs> or not. I mean, I, you know, there are obviously issues here that are um, specific to neurodivergent families, but even just That's any neat. Any sandwich support. That, that, that is a, that's a great, I mean, different communities are going to have different things too, right? There's going to have, um, there should be some locally, um, or they, there may be some locally, I don't want to say should, but depending on the size of your community, um, there may be caregivers support groups locally as well too. Do I know of any specific to neurodivergent families? Off the top of my head, I don't. Um, maybe that's, you know, that's something that uh, would be a, a great thing you know, to develop as well too. Um, I, certainly I'm hearing that there would definitely be a need for it as well. And it's going to be a growing area. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think even just, again, like listening to podcasts and blogs and, um, you know, Attitude Magazine is just a wealth of resources as well too in this regard. And even just that, like reading about or hearing about um, other people's experiences can be so, so validating for people. Yes. Um, I will mention um, Attitude does have, if if you are active on um, Facebook at all, we do have two Facebook groups, um, one group for adults with ADHD and another for parents um, of children with ADHD. We understand there's overlap, but there tend to be some um, questions that are specific to one or the other. So um, as a first stop, that mm -hmm. might be something to look at. It is we, Those groups are quite active and our uh, members are really wonderful about posting um their solutions to everyday mm -hmm. problems so um oh, it's I so would... helpful right yeah absolutely yeah i think yeah. That, that lived experience is, is just so valuable absolutely um well i have uh the bad news to share that we are out of time for today dana thank you so much for joining us today for contributing your voice to our adhd community um, and for giving us some solutions to, to get started here today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. I hope everyone takes really good care and I wish everyone all the best. And I also want to thank today's um, listeners. If you would like to access the resources from today's podcast um, or today's webinar, you can go to attitudemag.com and search for podcast number four. 90. You'll find the slides and the recording there. Um, if you're listening in replay mode, you can just click on the um, episode description to get all those resources. And please know that our full library of Attitude webinars is available as a podcast. It is called the ADHD Experts Podcast, and it is on all of the streaming platforms, um, all of them. Um, and we hope you will join us next week. We have a very special live conversation with YouTube personality, Jessica McCabe. She is the, um, <laughs> the personality behind How to ADHD, and she has a brand new book out by that title. So we hope you will join us 
for that and that you will sign up so you don't miss any of our webinars at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Dana, thank you again and have a great day, everybody. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise, having fun in the sun, or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024.